July 17th, 1969 is not a day that many associate as one of great significance. But in terms of aerial warfare, it was. Because that day saw the last kills made in aerial combat between piston engine aircraft. And even more remarkably, these occurred in two dogfights that were all achieved by the same pilot. This is the story of Captain Fernando Soto Henriquez of the Honduran Air Force and his scoring of three air-to-air -air kills in a single day. The event was also a critical point in the Honduran-Salvadorian War that was raging at the time. Before I start, I suspect many of you know of this conflict by the title of the Football or Soccer War. I will be delving more into the history of this conflict in a future video, principally the war in the air. But for now, I will just say that the name Soccer or Football Wars is not well liked by the people of the nations who fought, and so I will refer to the conflict as the Hundred Hour War. And as Soto's achievements are significant historically, in more than only marking the passing of the piston engine fighter, I think the dogfights fought that day deserve proper attention. Oh, and lots of Spanish names in this, which I will no doubt mess up. Have fun correcting me in the comments. Anyway, on July 14th, 1969, the El Salvadorian military invaded neighbouring Honduras after a period of prolonged tensions between the two countries. The attack caught the Hondurans largely by surprise, and they fell back before it. But over the next two days, resistance stiffened and the Salvadorians found themselves under pressure internationally as the Organization of American States, the OAS, pushed for a ceasefire. Needing to break the Honduran defences to achieve as favourable a position as possible before a ceasefire could be imposed upon them by the OAS, the Salvadorian High Command ordered an all-out attack on July 17th. On the war's eastern front, Salvadorian artillery lashed Honduran positions located on the Inter-American Highway between the towns of La Guaquimada and Santa Lucia. This was followed by infantry attacks and heavy fighting ensued. Desperate for help, the Honduran commanders requested immediate air support. In response, three Honduran Air Force F-4U-5N Corsairs were dispatched to help. This represented a major proportion of the Honduran Air Force's strength at that time. The Hondurans had started the conflict with a total of 11 Corsairs as their frontline fighter force. One of these had been interned in Guatemala on July 15th after landing there because of battle damage. The Corsair was, and is, a magnificent aircraft, and the F4U5Ns that were flying to engage the Salvadorian ground forces were the most modern that Honduras had. But that is a relative description, as the aircraft dated from the mid-1940s, and that's by 1969, these aircraft had seen a lot of hard use. And this showed itself in some odd ways. Throughout the conflict, Honduran Corsairs had reported problems with their 20mm cannon inexplicably jamming. At 11.45am, as they flew into the combat zone, Soto ordered the two pilots flying with him, Captains Edgardo Acosta and Francisco Zapida, to test fire their weapons. Somewhat unsurprisingly, Zapita's cannons failed. Soto ordered him to return to base while he and Acosta completed their mission. Zapita broke off and turned for home, but he was soon to be fighting for his life. As the three Corsairs had been approaching the combat zone, two Salvadorian fighters were coming in from the opposite direction. The aircraft were Cavalier Mustang IIs. Only delivered in 1968, the five Salvadorian Mustang IIs were the most up-to-date aircraft that participated in the war. Updated conversions of P-51D fighters, arguably the most famous American aircraft of the Second World War, these had originally been formidable dogfighters. The Mustang II upgrade had converted the airframes to increase their ground attack capability to provide allies of the United States with a cheap and effective counterinsurgency aircraft. They had also been fitted with fixed wingtip fuel tanks to increase their range and loiter times. Now the two approaching Mustangs piloted by Captains Douglas Varela and Leonel Lavo, dropped down to launch their own ground support mission in support of the Salvadorian assault, and they couldn't believe their luck, because in front of them was a single Honduran Corsair, seemingly easy prey. Zapida was paying attention, however, and as the two Mustangs dropped down behind him, he began to evade hard. Varela managed to get into a firing position and opened fire with his 50 caliber Browning machine guns, but Zapida managed to dodge the fusillade. By now, Zabida was, understandably, totally absorbed in flying for his life. 
But as Varela lined up for more shots on him, he was able to start yelling for help over the radio. Hearing him, Soto and Acosta jettisoned their bombs and turned about to come to his assistance. While Zapida threw his aircraft around desperately with Varela in hot pursuit, Soto rapidly closed on the Salvadorian. Swooping behind the Mustang, he opened fire, scoring hits with his 20mm cannon. Varela immediately began to try to evade by turning tightly and diving, but it was here that the additions made to the Mustang II proved fatal. The big wingtip tanks turned the Mustang into a much heavier and more unbalanced aircraft than the agile fighter it was converted from. They were an advantage for ground support work, but in a dogfight, they proved a lethal liability. Soto was able to follow the manoeuvring Mustang II down and managed to rake the cockpit and engine with cannon fire. Now burning, Varela's aircraft crashed into the forest's blow. There is some controversy on this episode, with Salvadorian sources stating that Varela was able to parachute from his stricken aircraft. They assert that he was then murdered by Honduran troops on the ground. The Hondurans state that Varela was killed in his cockpit by Soto's cannons. Regardless, the Salvadorians had suffered a major blow, and though the other Mustang II was able to escape despite the best efforts of Captain Acosta, much worse was to shortly follow. As the fighting continued to rage on the Eastern Front, the Salvadorians received intelligence that the Hondurans were planning an attack to destroy the bridge over the river Goascoran that marked the border. Such an attack, if successful, would cut off the Salvadorian forces in western Honduras, a potential catastrophe for the Salvadorian military. To counter this possibility, the Salvadorian air force were asked to provide a close air support element over the bridge. At 1400 hours, two Salvadorian Corsairs were dispatched to the area. These were Goodyear FG-1Ds. Broadly comparable to the Corsairs flown by the Hondurans, the five flyable FG-1s had formed the backbone of the Salvadorian Air Force before the introduction of the Mustang IIs. But though old like their Honduran opponents, they were still capable aircraft, and one had been damaged earlier in the war in the many support missions the type had flown. Additionally, the older style of armament of 650 caliber Browning heavy machine guns had none of the issues that the 20mm cannons of the Honduran aircraft had. The two aircraft, flown by Captains Renaldo Cortez and Salvador Cezena, flew several passes over the bridge and thoroughly surveyed the surrounding terrain for any enemy troops. With nothing obvious, and satisfied there was no threat to the bridge, they decided to climb to altitude and return to base. As they were making this decision, Soto, Sapida and Acosta were once again headed into the area. Their mission was to strike the Salvadorian artillery that was still giving Honduran troops a hard time, but once again, fate intervened. Soto ordered another gun check and, once again, Sapida's gun jammed. The unfortunate captain was again ordered out of the combat zone while his partners completed their attack missions. But this time, as Soto and Acosta dropped down to search for targets, they spotted the two Salvadorian Corsairs departing the area. No fighter pilot worth his salt passes up a chance to shoot down an aircraft and so the two Hondurans dropped their ordnance and throttled up to climb and catch the Salvadorians. These had crossed into El Salvador and though the Honduran pilots were forbidden to pursue across the border, Soto and Acosta weren't going to be denied. Soto closed in on the FG-1 of Captain Cezena and fired a burst of 20mm shells into it. The plane burst into flames and Cezena was forced to bail out. Cortez, realising they were under attack, swung his plane about to get onto Soto 6 and managed to score several hits with his machine guns. Soto in response began to manoeuvre violently, expecting his wingman to clear his 6. But it soon became apparent that Acosta had vanished from the scene and the fight was very much just between Soto and Cortez. A battle to the death developed as both pilots clawed for position and it was Soto who would win. After several minutes of intense aerobatics, he managed to get his sights on target and hit Cortez's cockpit and wing. Cortez continued to manoeuvre, but it seems likely he was injured as his flying became slower. Getting another chance, Soto hit the Salvadorian with more cannon shells and Cortez's FG-1 exploded in a fireball. Again, there are two stories told, and the Salvadorian histories say that Cortez deliberately crashed while attempting to land his damaged aircraft in order to save civilian lives. However, what isn't disputed is that Captain Soto had achieved a remarkable three aerial victories in a single day. This would have been an impressive feat during the Second World War, when many more combatants were in the air. 
But when you consider the actual impact that such an achievement made on the war, it was of huge significance. According to Dan Hagedorn and Mario Overall, by July 17th, the Salvadorian Air Force had eight primary combat aircraft available to them, four FG-1s and four Mustang IIs. Soto, on his own, shot down nearly 40% of these in a day, and that would have a critical impact on the Salvadorians' Romanian efforts to end the war to their advantage. It would also mark a rather impressive, though admittedly tragic, end to the dogfighting days of the piston engine fighter. I owe a massive thank you to Mario Overall for his assistance in making this video possible. If you want to know more about the conflict, I advise you look into picking up a copy of his and Dan Hagedorn's book, The Hundred Hour War, The Conflict Between Honduras and El Salvador in July 1969. It is unfortunately out of print, and I can't find any copies of it on Amazon, but it is, I believe, the best research available on the conflict, and a must if you want to know more. Hope you enjoyed this video, and keep an eye out for the follow-up video, where I will talk more about this conflict, more generally, and about some of the interesting improvisations both sides used.